Welcome to the Hurley Virtual Hernia Lecture. Uh, I am Dr. Christopher Wong, the director of the Hurley Hernia Center of Excellence. We are composed currently of six uh, hernia surgeons, uh, myself, Dr. Leo Mercer, uh, Dr. Dean Crystal, Dr. Gul Sashwani, Dr. Patrick Beer, and Dr. Lindsay Reich uh, just recently joined the Hernia Center of Excellence here at Hurley. Again, we are the region's only Hernia Center of Excellence uh, here at Hurley Medical Center. Uh, we are going to briefly go through uh, what the Hernia Center of Excellence stands for and what we offer. Uh, and then we'll have presentations by Dr. Lindsay Reich uh, about inguinal hernias. Dr. Patrick Beer is going to talk about ventral hernias. And Dr. Dean Crystal is going to talk about hiatal hernias. And then I will come back and talk about abdominal wall exploration and abdominal wall hernias uh, and reconstruction, as well as minimum invasive robotic techniques and a brief overview of mesh. The Hernia Center of Excellence uh, was set up here in uh, the region because of how frequent hernias occur uh, in the U.S. Over 5 million people have or suffer from some type of hernia. Uh, and we established the Hernia Center of Excellence to accomplish treatment uh, in a wide variety of techniques to a wide variety of patients. The Hernia Center of Excellence has been ongoing for the last seven years, uh, and we continue to offer a lot of different techniques for treatment of hernias. The designation is through the American Hernia Society. It is a rigorous process in which uh, they look at our data uh, and what we offer in both hernia treatment, patient care, and hospital care. The Hernia Center, again, launched in April of 2012 uh, through a rigorous evaluation, uh, specializes in all aspects of hernia care, uh, and offers both quality, clinical, and research uh, innovation in the treatment of hernias. We specialize in looking at effective treatment of hernias uh, with the least amount of pain. We focus on fast recovery through minimally invasive and or open uh, hernia techniques. Uh, and again, we are the only one in the region for the last nine years. Thank you, Dr. Christopher Wong, who you just heard from, is a general surgeon, surgical critical care trauma surgeon who went to Des Moines University College of Osteopathic Medicine. He had a residency at St. John Providence Health System and fellowship at Wayne State University. Now, after each of our next four segments, you're going to get your questions answered live. You can text me your questions at 248-935-2562. Or you can go on Facebook or YouTube and you can submit your questions there and we'll get them answered. Our next presenter is general surgeon, surgical critical care trauma surgeon, Dr. Lindsay Rick. Dr. Rick went to school at Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine. She had an internship and residency at McLaren Health System, a critical care fellowship at Detroit Medical Center and a trauma fellowship right here at Hurley. She's talking about inguinal hernias. Dr. Rick? My name is Lindsay Rick. I'm one of the trauma and acute care surgeons at Hurley Medical Center. I'm here to talk to you today about inguinal hernias. Inguinal hernias occur when tissue, such as your intestines, protrude through the abdominal wall. They're most often located in your groin as a painful bulge. It, they're not necessarily dangerous, but they will not resolve on their own and can sometimes lead to life-threatening complications. So some symptoms you may see is a bulge in the groin, um, nausea, vomiting, excruciating pain. Risk factors of a inguinal hernia is being male. Males are eight times more likely than females to develop a hernia. Obesity, chronic coughing, chronic strenuous activity with heavy lifting, bending down, being older as our abdominal muscle walls weaken as we get older, a family history or a personal history of a previous hernia, as well as constipation and pregnancy. So when should you see somebody about a hernia or when should it get fixed? When you're having increasing excruciating pain that's not going away, if 
you're having persistent nausea, vomiting, you're not passing gas, you're not having bowel movements, or you even notice some skin changes over the hernia. Your skin might be looking purple or red um, or dark. Those are all signs that you should be seen by a physician and will likely need surgery. So you found this bulge, you're having pain. How do we know it needs to be fixed? Uh, if you're having increasing pain, it's limiting your activity of what you can do. Um, you're not able to do a lot of bending over, lifting heavy things without it persistently bothering you. Um, if it becomes incarcerated, meaning it gets stuck, so sometimes that tissue will get stuck and you can't push it back in. Um, and once the hernia gets stuck, it's also at risk of becoming strangulated, meaning the blood flow gets cut off to the tissue inside. Where that becomes a problem is when you have intestines stuck in that hernia and the blood flow to the intestines gets shut off and then your, your intestines could die. And that is a surgical emergency. Um, hernias can be big, hernias can be small, uh, they can be felt, sometimes they're only seen on, on CAT scans. Um, all those are, are reasons to discuss with your surgeon whether or not you should have your hernia fixed. You've decided to get your hernia fixed, how do you proceed? Here at the Hernia Center of Excellence, we do pride ourselves on minimally invasive techniques using the robot, uh, occasionally laparoscopically as well. You see in that top picture, there are three ports. We have three small incisions that are below your belly button and off to the side that we use to get into your abdominal cavity to see the hernia. This is just a picture of the robot that we use to help us facilitate doing your surgery, as well as a picture of the mesh that we typically use. These are just some pictures of the inside that we see of the hernias. Um, how we take the hernia out of the, the hole that's creating the hernia, putting the mesh in, and then fixing your hernia. Here's just another picture. Uh, you can see the fatty tissue going into the hernia. We pull all that down, and then we cover that hole, which is how we fix your hernia. Dr. Leo Mercer is going to take your questions now. He is a general surgeon, surgical critical critical care trauma surgeon at Hurley, who did both of his residency and his fellowship at his alma mater, Texas Tech University Health Center. Um, thank you for joining us and answering some of these questions. The first um, question that came in on YouTube is, what's the typical recovery time for a mild hernia? For a small hernia, meaning uh, something that uh, looks a lot different than the one that uh, Lindsay showed in her presentation. Uh, usually a couple of weeks, uh, the, the mesh goes on the inside of the abdomen. So as, as people uh, begin to get up and move around, it tends to drive it into the, uh, into the inguinal floor, which is what we're hoping for. It, it integrates better, you get a much better repair. So long gone are the days when at six weeks of uh, lifting nothing any heavier than a dinner fork. If the inguinal hernia doesn't hurt, should you have surgery? Uh, the, the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, hernias are something that we understand the natural history of. They, they don't go away, uh, at least in adults, uh, and they tend to get larger. And the longer one has a, uh, a hernia, an inguinal hernia especially, uh, the greater the risk of getting a piece of bowel stuck down there that doesn't come out and it deprives its blood supply and eventually it will it will die and that's what we call a strangulated hernia. Um, Dr. Mercer, how fast does an inguinal hernia progress? It varies. It depends on the age of the person at the time that they get it. Uh, it depends on nutrition, the, the, the integrity of the of the body tissue that uh, there's actually uh, holding your abdominal contents in. It depends on your body weight. Uh, it depends on your job, your occupation, how much do you lift. But certainly if you have a small hernia, you can turn it into a, a larger hernia simply by, uh, by lifting, uh, lifting things. So it, it varies. So if you had a small hernia and you didn't do anything, is it possible that it could just stay that small or eventually is it gonna get bigger? No, if you have a small hernia and you, uh, you don't uh, get it fixed, then you will eventually 
over a period of time become the proud owner of a large hernia. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Mercer. General Surgeon, Surgical Critical Care Trauma Surgeon, Dr. Patrick Beer is going to join us next to talk about ventral hernias. Dr. Beer went to Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine. He had a residency at Detroit Medical Center and fellowships at Henry Ford Health System, as well as Hurley. Dr. Beer? Hi, how are you? I'm Dr. Patrick Beer. I work here at Hurley Medical Center as a general surgeon for the Hernia Center of Excellence. Today I'll be covering ventral hernias. To start, we'll talk about what is a ventral hernia. A ventral hernia is any defect that is in the anterior abdominal wall. When I say defect, I mean a hole in your abdominal wall. So what are different types and how do they present? First off, they can be congenital, meaning they've been present since birth. They can also be incisional, meaning that they were present from a previous surgery. And there can also be uh, secondary forms of ventral hernias. Most of the time, people feel a bulge or a mass in their abdominal wall. They can also feel a mass that does not reduce or does not go down. Some of the more severe symptoms can be nausea, vomiting, or severe pain. When we talk about these symptoms, we look at when do they occur. So some of the times when these symptoms do occur are either standing for a prolonged period of time, or most commonly is when lifting heavy objects. When we're talking about masses or bulges that don't go down, we are talking about an incarcerated hernia. When talking about incarcerated hernias, these are a more serious problem and should be dealt with immediately. Now, when we are talking about ventral hernias and when to look for a surgical consultation, really we're talking about any time there are symptoms. You'll feel a pain or a bulge around the area of the hernia. Commonly, this will then resolve once you're laying down. If the hernia does not reduce when lying down and you're unable to reduce it yourself, this is considered an incarcerated hernia. Incarcerated hernia means that some form of intra-abdominal fat and or small or large bowel has become stuck in this hernia. This can be, become very problematic and be very painful. When considering that, there's the progression where it can be strangulated, meaning that the blood supply to this either small bowel, large bowel, and or intra-abdominal fat loses its blood supply and this become, can become an emergency. The way these are repaired is through surgery and there are many different types of surgical operations. We here at the Hernia Center of Excellence offer all of these options. We always strive to have the most minimally invasive options as the first choice. We always tailor these options to the patient and their medical comorbidities. Some of these surgical options are robotically, laparoscopically, or open. They all have their own benefits and risks. And we, again, we tailor these repairs to both the patient as well as their hernia. There are three steps to fixing a ventral hernia. First is the reduction of the abdominal contents that are stuck in the hernia. Secondly is the repair of the defect, meaning closure of the hole. And thirdly is then reinforcing that defect with a mesh. Now, after talking about the different ways we can fix a hernia, we now start talking about recurrent hernias, large versus small hernias, and then as well as restoration of abdominal function, which again is the end goal, is to repair the hole and to repair the function of the abdominal wall the best we can. We always choose the most minimally invasive option, whether that is robotically or laparoscopically. After considering all of our different options of repair, we always like to start with the least invasive. This allows for shorter recovery time and a shorter time for you to get back to your normal daily life. Uh, okay, Dr. Beer, we do have some questions coming in for you. Uh, the first question is from Kim, and she says, 
you can have a hernia above your belly button? Yes, this is correct. You can have a, uh, a defect anywhere in your abdominal wall, whether it be above your umbilicus or below the umbilicus. Um, uh, somebody texted and said that they've been told they have a difficult hernia to repair because they have di diastasis recti and a, a ventral hernia from a gallbladder surgery. Is it still possible for them to have surgery or? Yes, we can repair that at the hernia center. Um, okay. We, off we often deal with these types of hernias on a regular basis. Um, one person has asked, I have a hiatal hernia for years. It's painful. What can I take for it? Um, well, you would like to be seen by one of our specialists here that deal with the hiatal hernias to see um, how severe it is, as well as get the whole workup uh, before we start talking about different medication. How long is surgery and is it outpatient? So that depends on the size of your defect as well as is that how we have to do to repair it. Um, they can be done as outpatients. The majority of them are. Um, but for some of our larger repairs, uh, sometimes you have a short hospital stay. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I do want to remind people, if you have a question you'd like our surgeons to answer for you now, you can text me at 248-935-2562. You can see we're getting your questions answered right away as soon as we can. And you can also post those questions on Facebook and YouTube, and we'll get the answers. Now, next, uh, general surgeon, surgical critical care trauma surgeon, Dr. Dean Crystal is going to talk to us about hiatal hernias. Uh, Dr. Crystal went to school at Michigan State and Wayne State. He did his residency and internship at Detroit Medical Center with a fellowship at New York Presbyterian Hospital Cornell Campus. Dr. Crystal? Hi, I'm Dr. Dean Crystal, uh, one of the surgeons at the Hurley Medical Center with the Hernia Center of Excellence, and I'm going to be talking to you about hiatal hernias. So unlike an inguinal hernia or an umbilical hernia, a hiatal hernia is a hernia that we can't see and that as physicians we can't feel when we examine you. And a hiatal hernia is where the stomach, which belongs in the abdomen, has actually slid up into the chest a little bit. So if you look at this slide, the uh, picture more on the left shows what the normal anatomy should be, where the entire stomach is in the abdomen. And the picture on the right shows where a portion of the stomach has slid up into the chest. And that's what we're talking about when we say hiatal hernia. And this slide here further uh, emphasizes that point with the two pictures on the right showing a, a hiatal hernia where part of the stomach has slid up into the chest. Now, some people have hiatal hernias and they don't even know it. This is what we would call an asymptomatic hiatal hernia, meaning they have it, but they don't have any problems or symptoms from it. Now, when this does cause problems, by far the most common problem it causes is reflux disease or heartburn. And uh, if we look here, it, uh, a hiatal hernia can cause a myriad of problems, not just reflux, but again, that's the most common. But it can also cause issues with chest pain, um, regurgitation of food or liquids back into the mouth, uh, periods of frequent bloating, especially after we eat, and it can especially cause issues with bad reflux or regurgitation at night while we sleep. There's some other atypical symptoms, which are mostly respiratory, such as asthma or even COPD or a persistent cough or sore throat or even trouble swallowing. So the question is then, when do we fix these hernias? Um, typically patients who have reflux disease or heartburn the first step that their primary care provider would probably do is try to get the patient to um, change their lifestyle a bit. And this means quitting smoking, um, reducing or quitting caffeine intake, modifying the foods that we eat, modifying the timing of when we eat so that we're not eating right before bed. When this doesn't work, the next step is medications. And uh, typically, this can be anything from your over-the-counter antacids like Tums or Mylanta that you take when you're feeling heartburn symptoms, 
and usually progresses on to a daily medication, some of which you might have heard, like Zantac or Nexium or Prilosec. And a lot of patients have good relief with these medications, and they're happy. Uh, but some people, they don't want to be on medication for the rest of their life. And even worse, in other patients, um, the medication simply stop working, where they'll be taking a medicine every day, but they still have repeated attacks of heartburn or other symptoms, and they want this addressed. So the reason to fix a hiatal hernia is simply if it causes symptoms. Um, simply just having heartburn and a hiatal hernia would be a reason to um, at least talk about an operation. And furthermore, if you're on medications, even if they're controlling your symptoms well, but you just don't want to be on medication for the rest of your life, that can be another reason to pursue surgery. And there's some other um, more severe complications of hiatal hernias that would also require surgical attention. So how do we fix these hernias? What's our surgical approach? What do we do? First of all, at the Hernia Center of Excellence, our priority is a minimally invasive approach. And that means instead of one big incision for the operation, we typically make multiple small incisions. And this is important because it can reduce the amount of pain we have after surgery, uh, and it can also speed up our recovery. So to fix uh, the hiatal hernias, we'll show some pictures here. The first step is to get that stomach back down into the abdomen where it belongs. So we got to pull it out of the chest and bring it down into the abdomen. And then that hiatus, that hiatal hernia, the hole that uh, became too large to allow the stomach to get up into the chest, needs to be closed. And the top two pictures um, on this slide show that. It shows suturing that hernia closed so that it's nice and snug around the esophagus. And then the next two pictures on the bottom there um, show a mesh which is sometimes placed to reinforce the repair and to prevent the hernia from recurring. Um, and then the last picture on the bottom right shows uh, uh, the last but really important step where we actually take part of the stomach and we wrap it around the esophagus. And this serves a couple of purposes. Number one, it creates a nice kind of tight valve at the top of the stomach so that we don't get liquids and acid coming up into the esophagus. And that's gonna help prevent those heartburn and reflux symptoms um, that the patients have been experiencing. And the second reason is this also prevents the stomach from sliding back up into the chest. Dr. Gal Shashwani, general surgeon and surgical critical care trauma surgeon is here to take some of your questions now. Dr. Shashwani went to school at Des Moines University with a residency and internship at St. John Providence Health System and a fellowship here at Hurley. Thanks for joining us. Um, someone's asking if you can't see or feel it and you don't have symptoms, how do you know you have a hiatal hernia? Well, if you don't have the symptoms that Dr. Crystal, can you hear me first of all? Yes. Oh, you know, if you don't have the symptoms that Dr. Crystal kind of went over, then it's less likely that you would have a hiatal hernia. Now, uh, some people undergo routine EGDs because, you know, either um, they were having issues with swallowing and uh, their PCP uh, had their GI partners get a EGD done. And that's how sometimes we pick up the hiatal hernia is through routine endoscopy. But mostly if you don't have the symptoms that were just listed, less likely that you would have a hiatal hernia. Um, someone is asking, I've heard a hiatal hernia can be caused by HERD. I have both and am having upper end endoscopy exams soon. Is this common practice? Can you repeat that? It says, uh, GERD. Um, I've heard a hi hiatal hernia can be caused by GERD. I have both and I'm having upper endoscopy exams soon. Is this common practice? It is common practice. And just so you know, it's usually the other way around. The hiatal hernia is the one that causes the uh, uh, GERD, what we know as gastroesophageal reflex symptoms. So they both go hand in hand. And what that person is having done is adequate, which is an endoscopy to evaluate. Um, this person is, says, I had a bulge on the right side under the belly button and was told it was a hernia. It has, for the most part, went down. 
sometimes somewhat numb. Should I get a second opinion? I, if you have a bulge that has been present just next to your uh, belly button, that is most likely a hernia. And the numbness that you're feeling is probably because there's a lot of pressure from the inside. So I would definitely seek uh, a, a attention, either a second opinion or, 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 or at our hernia center. If I have reflux or heartburn, should I get checked for a hiatal hernia? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And that, the only way that we do that is, like I said, an endoscopy. So we also have a fluoroscopic test, which is called an upper GI series that's done at the radiology uh, department in which they make you drink some contrast. And it also shows the motility of the contrast and we can see reflux. But the gold standard is to get an, an endoscopy done. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shashwani. Um, next, our director of the Hernia Center of Excellence, Dr. Christopher Wong, is going to address large ventral hernias, minimally invasive surgery, and mesh. So I'm gonna talk about uh, large ventral hernias uh, to kind of expand on what Dr. Beer talked about for ventral hernias. These unfortunately are large uh, loss of abdominal domains, usually secondary to multiple hernia recurrences, large uh, midline laparotomy incisions, and uh, abdominal trauma. A lot of the times these are not dealt with at the majority of regular uh, general surgeons. Uh, a lot of these are referred to hernia centers for advanced surgical techniques. Typically these require some sort of abdominal muscle release uh, and movement of your abdominal wall to reestablish the normal anatomy. Here are some abdominal examples of abdominal ventral hernias with loss of abdominal domain. A lot of these uh, typically look relatively disfigured. Uh, you will see, you know, in this picture that the intestines is visible through the skin with almost complete loss of a his abdominal domain. Uh, after surgery, uh, this is what it, the post-operative photo looked like. And as you can tell, that tattoo at the abdominal wall is almost back to midline. Uh, and this was done approximately three to four years ago. And this patient still has no recurrence of his hernia and is doing well uh, after a very traumatic injury. Again, uh, we use a lot of abdominal muscle relaxing incisions and uh, fascial techniques in order to bring the abdominal midline, to, uh, the abdominal wall to the midline. We also use uh, Botox injections to cause relaxation of the oblique muscles and help those come to the midline as well. Now, giant hernias can be uh, as extreme as this after multiple surgeries uh, even on thin patients it does not happen only on obese patients and the goal of every patient walking into the hernia center is to look like this after surgery with a nice six pack and wake up uh, all muscular uh, but our goal at the hernia center is to decrease the chance of recurrence Again, our goal is to have one abdominal ventral hernia repair uh, and for it to last the majority of your lifetime without uh, recurrence. What we offer in terms of surgical techniques, uh, especially here at the hernia center, is more minimally invasive opportunities. When we talk about the robotic uh, platform and the Da Vinci Intuitive platform, a lot of patients think that the robotic the robotic surgery is just done by the robot. It's actually not. Uh, we are actually sitting at the console in the room. Uh, the console actually allows us to visualize the anatomy almost as if we're in the patient itself uh, with three-dimensional vision uh, for finer dissection, more precise dissection. It also use, uh, utilizes wristed instruments. So I can use the full range of motion of my wrists to sew, dissect, and cut tissue away, uh, which decreases pain and tension and torque on the outer skin as we're doing the surgery. This picture shows a typical operating room with the surgeon at the console uh, and the uh, surgical techs at the bedside uh, assisting the surgeon. 
The benefit of minimally invasive surgery in general, both laparoscopic and robotic surgery, is you get smaller incisions, uh, no large midline incisions. Small incisions usually equate to less pain. Less pain typically equates to faster recovery, and that means both return to work and return to your normal activities with a shorter hospital stay. Longer term uh, pain, uh, evaluation typically is less, um, meaning that over time the pain is much less, the narcotic use is much less. The benefit of the minimally invasive surgery also allows for increased coverage with mesh, meaning we can put a larger piece of mesh in uh, with small incisions as opposed to we're limited to the size of mesh through a large incision. And then the there's been well-documented research showing a significant decrease in rates of infection and minimally invasive techniques. The last portion that I'm gonna talk about is mesh. Everybody knows um, that mesh is a hot topic. Everybody who watches late night television always asks at the hernia center when they come in for the surgery, is this a mesh that has been recalled on your late night commercials? All the mesh that we use at this hospital has not been recalled through any of the FDA lawsuits or anything like that. Again, mesh is necessary for the majority of patients, but we take a relatively patient-centric approach to those hernias that we see in the office. There are instances where mesh is necessary. Again, uh, as you look there, are you that uh, retiree or patient that does not do heavy lifting or does not do any strenuous activity, that patient and you may qualify for some sort of tissue repair. Now, if you do a lot of heavy lifting through work or exercise or activity, mesh typically is a better option. It's a longer term option. Um, and unfortunately, that's something that usually goes hand in hand with patients that have recurrent hernias and the need for mesh. Mesh unfortunately gets a bad rap. Uh, a lot of lawsuits, a lot of blogs and things like that online talk about that mesh causes pain, mesh uh, is bad, it can cause infection. All those things sometimes happen, but again, the use of minimally invasive techniques, the use of certain types of mesh and using the mesh in the correct area are what decrease all those things from happening. Things like infection, things like recurrence, uh, and things like pain. Again, mesh is a tool. It is necessary. It helps your body heal. It helps the scar tissue form and decrease the chance of recurrence. Again, thank you for your attention uh, to this lecture. Uh, here at the Hurley Hernia Center of Excellence, we strive to recommend and treat uh, your hernia individually. And again, our motto is the right hernia surgery for you. Oh, Dr. Wong, um, I got a text from someone who said that they had an incisional, they have an incisional hernia from a adrenalectomy, and they're wondering if uh, it's safe to repair that. Uh, so yes, uh, an incisional hernia can be caused by any surgical procedure as simple as a laparoscopic procedure, obviously a larger procedure as it violates the anterior abdominal wall. Um, so basically, it, in short, it can be repaired. Um, there's always a 35% risk of having what is an incisional hernia after any type of surgery. Um, and it is a very common uh, outcome after any type of incision. So if you had a surgery, I don't know, you had your appendix out or something or gallbladder out or, and you got a hernia, would you then go to a herni hernia specialist like a center of excellence to repair or? Um, again, any hernia can be repaired by a general surgeon. What we at Hurley Medical Center and the Hernia Center of Excellent off Excellence offer are of a variety of techniques that uh, general surgeons typically are not comfortable with. We offer a variety of repairs, both minimally invasively and open. Uh, and we try to specialize in 
outcomes that are measured in terms of patient satisfaction, patient recovery, and quick return back to work and play. Um, this question is, I have a hiatal hernia and also a blood clotting disorder, and I am prone to blood clots. Can I still get hernia repair surgery? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, we work with your hematology doctor or your primary care physician uh, and discuss how long you can safely be off your blood thinners. Uh, and then obviously restarting those blood thinners as soon as possible to decrease the chance of blood clots. How long is surgery and what does the recovery look like? Uh, for the variety of surgeries that we offer and we cover today, things like inguinal hernias and ventral hernias, uh, depending on the size, a lot of the times that surgery can last from anywhere from 45 minutes uh, up to two and a half hours, depending on the technique used. Uh, hiatal hernias, again, same thing, about two and a half hours or so. Uh, the majority of that recovery is within three days, uh, kind of moving around, having a little bit of post-operative pain, uh, up to a week. Uh, we typically tend to have follow-ups usually a week after uh, the surgical procedure. And from there, we kind of gauge uh, based on the size of the hernia that we saw during the surgery and your job that you typically do. and uh, slowly lift the lifting restrictions uh, in the recovery period within the first two to three weeks. Can you strengthen your abdominal wall to prepare for a repair before or after surgery? Um, you can. Unfortunately, a lot of patients who have large ventral hernias, their abdominal wall muscles uh, become contracted. So unfortunately, no amount of sit-ups or core exercise are going to bring those uh, muscles back to the midline. Now, patients who are obese or overweight, unfortunately, uh, they have a tendency to have thinning of the abdominal wall muscles as they've lost a lot of their core strength. Uh, in that aspect, uh, lifting and trying to increase your core muscles will help in terms of the recovery, uh, but usually because of the size of the hernia, it's recommended that some type of surgical procedure uh, be performed. Uh, however, that's Unfortunately, not the case with uh, rectus diastasis, as that was our, uh, earlier addressed uh, in the hernia talk. That, unfortunately, has a lot to do with thinning of the muscles uh, and is not technically a hernia. That itself uh, does um, can be fixed with strengthening the core muscles and improving the core strength, either through physical therapy, uh, or exercise regimen that will increase the core strength and sometimes uh, relieve the rectus diastasis. I've been told I should change my lifestyle. Will If I do that, will my hernia go away? Unfortunately, no. Uh, depending on the size of the hernia um, and the type of hernia, it will not go away. A lot of hernias may uh, have intermittent symptoms depending on the size where they have pain, uh, or the fat may be herniated that it'll eventually get reduced and the pain will go away. Uh, but unless you're under the age of five years old as a child, a lot of hernias do not uh, go away on their own. A lot of them require some type of surgical therapy. It looks like this might be the last question, but mesh still makes me nervous. Uh, how do you know yours is different? Uh, so here at the Hurley Hernia Center of Excellence, we offer a variety of different types of mesh from synthetic mesh, which uh, in basic terms mean that it's non-absorbable. It does not go away. Uh, we offer other meshes like the biosynthetic mesh option, uh, which means that over time that mesh is absorbed. Or we even offer a biologic mesh uh, option, which again, that is a living tissue uh, that eventually goes away and is completely absorbed. Um, we offer tissue-based repairs to those patients that require those type of surgical options. So the benefit of the Hernia Center of Excellence is we look at each patient individually based on that patient's uh, history and the previous hernia repairs and offer the best procedure with the right type of mesh for them. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong and your entire team for joining us today. I thank you guys for listening and tuning in and answering, uh, asking questions, and I hope to see you guys in the clinic.